About a month ago, Sony made an announcement of a new line of cinema camera, the Sony FX30. And I did a reaction video saying that essentially this is going to be a great starting point for people getting into the cinema line. And it's also going to work as an amazing B camera for someone that has an FX3, an FX6, or even an FX9. Now, I'm minding my word, and I did actually make the pre-order, so today's video, we're going to be talking about the Sony FX30, first impressions, first look, and who I think this camera is for. All right, so let's go ahead and unbox this Sony FX30. Now, I will say it is kind of weird that the more expensive cameras use this kind of cardboard box type of look, but I'm all for saving the environment. I'm going to take out these warranty cards because nobody really reads these, and then we have a charging cable. So I don't think the FX30B is gonna have the kind of wall charger. A lot of cameras that are like sub four or five thousand dollars don't have them. I'm gonna pop this guy open. Well there's nothing in here, that's that's for sure. Well I know what that is and we're gonna save that for last. There we are. So these two little kind of plastic thingies or styrofoam. One is going to have a Sony Z battery, which cameras should have. They should have batteries, that makes sense. And just like I suspected, it doesn't have the actual wall charger. It probably just has a normal plug-in. So you gotta plug that through USB-C into the camera and into your wall. But we have this guy. This is the Sony FX30. So it looks almost exactly like a Sony FX3, which isn't a bad thing. The body design for the FX3 is really nice, but this looks and feels identical to it, except for prop sensor. So this is the Sony FX30, and it looks identical to the FX3, which a lot of you guys did see at the announcement, except for it's APS-C sensor that's right here. So first impressions right out the gate, the Sony FX30 and the Sony FX3, they look the same, they feel the same, they probably even smell the same. They have the same screw holes, except there's a different color in them. Obviously there's a sensor size difference, but for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much the same camera from a cosmetic standpoint. They even went as far as giving you a dead battery when you get it. So you have to go and charge it just to get things working. But thankfully I do have quite a few batteries. So we're gonna pop one in and actually go through some of the menu settings. All right, so we're gonna get into the camera settings and it actually does look like that Sony FX3 firmware update that people had mentioned in other videos. Now I did have the FX3 at one point, but I ended up selling it before the firmware update. So this is all kind of new to me. But what I do like is I can change my frame rate and all of my modes on this little quick menu so if I wanna go as far as having like the right shutter speed, I'm gonna go 24 frames a second. If I want my ISO to be a certain range, I can make all of the decisions on this little quick menu setting, which actually makes the operation of the camera a little bit easier. Now, something I like doing right off the bat is I actually set up my picture profiles because Contrary to popular belief, you don't actually have to use PP11 to give you whatever that is. If that's S-Log3 or whatnot, you can actually set things custom to how you like it. So for example, I like making PP1 my S-Log3 footage instead of this movie here. So what I can do is I can go down into say S-Log3, I can change my color mode into sgamut3.cine and I can make those adjustments and I never have to go and sift all the way through to go and find PP11 or whatever it's called to make sure that I'm in the right picture profile. But this quick menu does come in handy. Now it doesn't really change a lot of things about the image quality, but it does just make using the camera a little bit easier. You also get all of the same shooting modes as the Sony FX3. So I can go right up to here and I get XAVCSI, I can get the HD, I can get the HS, I can get all the settings that I'm used to on the other Sony cameras like my A7 IV or even on my FX6. Now, one thing that I do know that's a little bit different on here is going to be the log shooting mode. So this is something that's a little bit new to me because the Sony a7 IV doesn't have it, but I can go into Cine EI, which is a setting I'll save for another video, but this setting right here is a way to maximize dynamic range and get the most out of shooting, especially when you're using S-Log3. So I'm just gonna turn that on there and I'm gonna start setting that up. Now again, this is a first impressions video and I'm just quickly going through some of the menu settings, but it does have a lot of things that are very similar to the Sony FX3. And it might beg the question, why would somebody even want this camera, especially as somebody that might be an FX6 user or just have more expensive cameras than it? And there's a couple of reasons why I decided to pick up this camera. 
Number one, if you don't have two cameras, you barely have one. And me working professionally, I do like to have B and C cameras for a multitude of different reasons, especially when I'm filming things on this channel or when I'm shooting stuff for clients. One acts as my wide camera angle and another one acts as my more telephoto camera angle. Now the Sony FX3 for me, it was just a little bit of overkill just for a B camera. So I ended up selling it and investing that money into other things. But when Sony announced a camera that's very much like it for half of the price, it's almost irresponsible not to pick something like this up. On top of that, when I'm working on smaller run productions, sometimes I do little videos or social media shoots. I don't necessarily want to have a lot of camera with me. Now I do have the Sony a7 IV, but that's mostly my photography body, especially because on the odd occasion it might overheat. So I wanted to have something that was dedicated for video. It was small and compact, but also was affordable enough for me to carry my bag and not feel stressed out all the time. Now that being said, my other two cameras are full frame, so I am gonna be keeping full frame glass on this camera body. But that also means I'm gonna pair my 20 millimeter lens and we're gonna get some test footage. So for this test footage, I did shoot everything in S-Log3. I'm also using the native ISO of 800 and I'm also using Cine EI as a way to index my exposure to make sure I'm getting the most dynamic range. Now I did do all of these tests at my local gym or in natural lit situations because who would I be if I wasn't gonna be doing those things? But it was also a great way for me to test dynamic range of this camera, which is something that I find is one of the more important things in getting image quality out of any camera. Now, a lot of people are gonna mince over the 15 or the 14 stops of dynamic range between the FX30 and some of the other cameras, but in S-Log3 using Cine EI, it did one job that I find more important, is can I expose for my highlights and get some shadow detail at the same time? without having a lot of friction and not having to do a lot of editing. And the FX30 does a fine job of doing that. I did try to expose for the windows and also try to expose for inside of the gym at the same time, and it did a pretty good job of doing that. But with crop sensor cameras, you also are going to need a little bit more light. If things aren't a little bit more overexposed and you do have some underexposure there, it is easier to get more noise, which means you need to expose a little bit higher or just bring in more light, which honestly for a cinema camera and having it being worked for professional settings, lighting is something you should probably have anyways. Overall, I think the footage looks really good. It has great color, it has great dynamic range, and a lot of video features that I would use in things like YouTube and professional application. Which answers the question for me of whether or not this Sony APS-C camera is going to be used for professional settings. And to be honest, I think it's something that's perfect for professionals, whether you're someone that's starting out or continuing your journey. Just a few short years ago, I was doing a lot of my professional work on the Blackmagic Pocket 4K and the Canon C200. And I've even used the C70 and the Red Komodo, and all of those are Super 35 sensors natively. And to be honest, a lot of my clients for professional work didn't necessarily notice or care. And a lot of other creators, if I didn't tell them what camera I was using probably wouldn't have noticed a difference anyways. And the Sony FX30 is in a lot of ways no different. I found the image to be nice, I found it to be reasonably clean for its price point. It had a lot of features that people can use in professional situations. And when I see people on the internet that are going around saying that APS-C isn't deemed well enough for professional work, not only do I think that's a little bit short-sighted because you're not necessarily reading the room of what deems to be professional, but you're also kind of implying that your particular situation is the best situation for everybody. There's a lot of benefits to having APS-C cameras, particularly having a lower price point. Unfortunately, right now we're gonna move into the R word that nobody wants to say, and some people wanna get into professional work to help mitigate and bridge that gap in their finances. And having a camera that's gonna have like what, 85% of the professional features in the Sony FX3, but it's gonna be a crop sensor, I think is still gonna be used a lot in professional settings, especially with small run productions or having a B or a C camera. And on top of that, there might be other cameras available around in this price point, the Canon R7 and the Fuji X-H2S. But for somebody that already has a Sony system, the FX30 is gonna be the choice that you're gonna make most of the time. Unless you're somebody that wants to buy a whole new set of lenses, or you're a freelancer where you're not working on other teams where they're also using Sony cameras, you can go and explore those things and they might be great options for you. 
But for me in particular, somebody that works with other teams or works on my own productions, everything that's in that kind of middle gap that's not necessarily a high-end production and something that's not necessarily a $200 video, the Sony FX30 works great, especially as a B camera, a C camera, or even if you're somebody that's just starting out or you're working with teams that already use the Sony ecosystem. So this is my first look and first impressions of the Sony FX30. It looks a heck of a lot like the Sony FX3, it has great image quality, it has everything that you would expect from a high quality camera with a crop sensor, and to be honest, if you're lighting your subjects properly, you know how to dial in the settings on your camera, I don't think the APS-C is that big of a deal.